Good morning. I'm in Calstock, a little Cornish town, and it is 7.15, and it's actually the last day of our trip here. Um, this video is going to be a little different to my usual videos. When I go out hiking with my wife, she doesn't really want to get up at 5 in the morning, drive for an hour and a half, hike down to a beach, and then stand there in the freezing cold while I take a photo of a rock for about an hour and a half. Uh, that's not really what she's interested in. I don't know why, but... Um, so what we did instead is we just went for a hike. I did take some photos and she did wait patient, patiently for me, but no sunrise, no sunset. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of voice over our hikes, show you some pictures. If you want to see all the pictures, you can see them on my website. I'll uh, make an article and I'll pop them all in there. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. And when you finish watching that, I'm going to be back here taking a photo of this epic bridge as the sun comes up, which it should be doing in about 10 minutes. All right, I guess I'll see you in a bit. Our first walk was lucky number 13, titled Mount Edgecombe, The Sound and Corsand. Starting from Kremel, where the River Tamar meets the sea, we wandered through the Mount Edgecombe Country Park as families walked and played in the fields of the estate. We're slowly collecting and completing the Ordnance Survey guidebooks, outstanding circular walks, so if you're interested in any of the walks in this video, check out the link in the description for a copy for yourself. The views over the bay were beautiful. It was a crisp and sunny day, the calm waters twinkling under naval ships and sea boys. My wife and I are big fans of walking. It gets you out and about, seeing the beautiful countryside of the UK, it makes you feel good being amongst nature, but most importantly, it's free. Shortly thereafter we joined a wooded section of the southwest coast path with woodland paths winding along the steep cliffs. A diversion took us up onto the park grounds but after a while we rejoined the coast path past Fort Picklecoom. A lunch stop at the seaside town of Kingsand was a beautiful diversion and lent the opportunity for some photography of a quaint and picturesque Cornish seaside town. With the majority of the walk completed, we headed inland towards the car, leaving behind ocean views in favour of fallen trees and curious cattle. Our second day began with Walk 4, West Pentire, the Kelseys and Holywell Bay, and what was potentially my favourite walk of the trip. From West Pentire, we walked along the coastal path out onto Pentire Point West with a fantastic view over the beach. I remarked to Nikki that this looked like a great surfing beach for someone who could swim and wasn't deathly afraid of the ocean. We wandered along as the typically windy coastline became ever more rugged, the ocean was a rich and fantastic teal blue, a colour that one could easily mistake for being the coastline of a scenic Mediterranean town. At this point I'd not found any good compositions. Ask any landscape photographer how easy it is to shoot during the midday sun and they'll reply that it sure isn't. As we rounded the coastline towards Porth Joke we noticed a crowd had gathered looking towards the waves that were breaking on the beach. We headed over and were pleasantly surprised we met with some Cornish wildlife, two seals playing in the waves. We sat and watched for a while before continuing on the path down toward the beach and back up the other side. At the top of the path yet another crowd had gathered and this time we were even more pleasantly surprised. Two we'd seen earlier had come back to play and were fighting and wrestling in the water while the others rested.
Back on the path around Kelsey Head towards a brilliant Holywell beach. Again I remarked that I'm sure surfers would enjoy the waves, but Nikki can attest to the fact that watching me in the water is like watching a drowned rat, it's just a bit sad. Through the dunes I was met with some absolutely excellent photographic opportunities. There was plenty of foreground interest in the grass, leader nines as the path took you through the image, curves and shapes of coastline and beach, out to sea where an island in the bay attracts your gaze. I'm sure that these would have been even more brilliant images at sunrise or sunset, as it is I'm super pleased with the shot I got here, especially considering they were shot in the midday sun. A little tired from our walk, we finished off the day with a visit to St Agnes Head and the Wheel Coats Tin Mine. The mine that could be seen today was opened in 1802, though earliest records indicate mining since 1692. The mine closed in 1889 when the price of tin fell and the buildings were stabilised and preserved in 1986. We didn't get far down the coastal path before we decided to head home where cold beers and hot food awaited. The third day brought drizzle, so we turned our sights indoors. I remember when the Eden project was being built in 2001. I'd written into Blue Peter with designs for a flood-proof house that lifted on hydraulic stilts, and I was rewarded with the greatest honour an 11-year-old child could have bestowed upon them, a Blue Peter badge which would give free entry to the wearer to the Eden project. I'm not sure a 30-year-old man would get away with wearing a Blue Peter badge for free entry, so we stumped up the £28 each to get in. The two domes held plants for tropical biomes and Mediterranean biomes, whereas presumably the plants dotted around the grounds lived in more temperate climates. It's very cool seeing the density of the foliage in the jungle dome and I pondered how one could easily get lost in a real jungle. It was also really cool seeing fruit, herbs and spices we're used to seeing on shelves growing on plants. The Mediterranean dome was very cool also, with lots of plants from drier climates such as succulents and citrus fruits. On our way out we visited an exhibition which blew smoke rings. I don't know what it was for and I didn't care to find out because watching the smoke rings was intoxicatingly satisfying. Overall, I would say the Eden project is expensive for what it is, but it's worth a visit and it's all for a good cause. Our fourth day started bleak. We parked up near a small church in Morwenstow to begin the walk titled Hawker Country, Morwenstow and Marsland Mouth. Rain was drizzling, ominous clouds loomed and the wind was howling. We decided to just check out the coastline and if the weather turned we'd head back. The walk runs along the cliff tops on the southwest coast path. The going was pretty hard, rain from previous days had made the steep descent slick with mud and on more than one occasion I felt I might slip over and end up both me and the camera caked in mud. But the views were worth it. The rugged coastline was again quite the spectacle and we sat atop one of the cliff edges just far enough back for the wind to blow over our heads while we watched the rain off the coast slip past us. It was
was pretty exciting walking along the coast with impending rain heading towards us only for it to blow past on the coastline where we'd just been. About a third of the way through the walk we came up on Gull Rock, an outcrop of rock on a beautifully grey and black textured stone beach. This kind of coastline is photography on easy mode. There's so much detail and interest within the scene it's sometimes hard to know where to point the camera and what to keep in the frame. Ultimately, it was fairly simple. The waves on the beach would be the foreground interest as well as the leading lines taking you through the frame with your eye resting on the furthest point of Gull Rock. Your eye would then be launched out to sea to look at the clouds, but the focal point would keep you at the end of Gull Rock. Most of the time I know before I shoot that this image will be a black and white, but sometimes I don't know. This time, while processing the image, I couldn't quite get the image to work in colour, and on my second run through, after taking a few days break from editing, I popped it into black and white and immediately knew this was the best way to present the image. I'm very, very pleased with this photograph. With intentions to only walk the coastal part of the walk, but finishing it very quickly, we decided to just go ahead and complete the loop. Country lanes and footpaths over fields, through woodland and over rivers and through many small farmstead, we made it back to Morwenstow with time to spare. We'd somehow managed to stay lucky with the weather. It was all sunshine and rainbows as the forecasted rain passed us by on more than one occasion. Being in Cornwall, and being a human with a typically irrational desire to go somewhere purely for the sake of going somewhere, I had us up early to embark on the two hour drive to Land's End, Cornwall's most bizarre tourist attraction. We parked in Sennan Cove at around 10am and it was very quiet. A top tip if you want to avoid the chaos that is trying to leave Sennan Cove, park at the top of the hill and walk down, you won't regret it. Walking up the hill with a small seaside town behind us was a real pleasure and once again the Cornish coastline delivered. Again joining the southwest coast path, we wandered along the cliff top accompanied by spectacular views down the cliff faces to the turquoise ocean waves crashing on the rocks below. At one point we passed an old shipwreck that had been there since 2003. The National Trust said that the chief officer on watch had fallen unconscious and according to Wikipedia he had caught his trousers on his chair as he got up, causing him to fall and rendering him unconscious. I personally wonder how much rum he may have had. As we arrived at Land's End, I snapped a picture of the famous sign. We opted not to wait in line and spend £12 on an official photograph that stood next to the sign, no matter how tempting that may be, and decided instead to steer clear of the Wallace and Gromit theme park weirdness that was the official Land's End and continue on to much more enticing vistas. The cliffs, the coastline, the sea, it was all stuff we'd seen before but it didn't make it any less enthralling. We wandered gently along the path, stopping briefly for lunch with a view, before returning back the same way to Senen Cove. We made a brief stop at Porth Kerno, home of the famous open air Minak Theatre. I don't have any shots of it, so you'll just have to check out this blurry image from Cornwall Live. The beach at Porth Kerno was magical. 
The only way to tell that this wasn't a tropical paradise was the fact that everyone sat on the beach was in jeans and coats. Our sixth and final day we decided to head to Tintagel upon recommendation of a friend. We didn't go inside and instead opted for a 10 mile loop walk heading off from Tintagel once again along the southwest coast path, up past Boz Castle and back through fields before briefly passing through a wooded glen with a river. Once again we were blessed with beautiful crisp weather. The sun was shining but the wind kept us cool for the duration of the walk. Following the fairly gentle path to Boz Castle we enjoyed views out across the ocean of rock formations and beaches, fluffy clouds and green fields and past some of the local domestic cattle that stood defiantly while you climbed through bramble to avoid them. I took a couple of shots, but after six days of hiking and photography, my interest in midday coastal scenes was waning. I didn't hate the shots I got, but I wasn't in love with them either. Boss Castle was a typical Cornish town, and I stopped for a pasty before heading on the return journey, a relaxing walk with views back across the cliff path we'd just been on, and before long we headed into the woods and along a small river, soon popping out the other side and back to Tintagel to finish our final hike of the trip. So if you're back, uh, you either skipped forward, and I wouldn't blame you if you did, or you watched it to the end, and if so, I hope you enjoyed it. We're kind of hoping for the sun to rise. So the sun's rising in this direction at the moment, which means that as it comes up, the bridge is gonna be cast in like golden light, hopefully. What about foreground interest? So there's a few options, actually. I mean, it's obvious really, it's the boats, isn't it? The boats are going to be the foreground interest and you'll use the, li the, the lines from the mast to, to sort of draw your eye up to the bridge. I mean, your eye is going to be drawn to the bridge anyway, but anything that you can do to bring your eye back to that focal point, you know, as you look around the image, you're going to be seeing, you know, other bits of interest. And what you want is for your eye to go to the other point of interest but not get stuck there you want the, the leading lines to draw you back to the the focal point which is obviously the bridge so i'm going to go and have a wander and find a composition that i like first of all i'm going to shoot this mist it's always the benefit of getting up early in the morning okay let's go and find a composition So I've got what I reckon is a good composition. As I said, it's this sailboat in the foreground, and then you're drawn through the image past another sailboat. Then you've got the, the bridge, and it's reflected in the water. It's really simple, not too many distractions, but I'm gonna have to quickly swing this way so I can show you the beautiful color on the, uh, on the sunrise.
changed up the composition a little bit. I came to the end of this sort of jetty thing and I feel like it balances the composition a bit more. You have the bigger sailboat to the left of the frame and then the smaller sailboat in the middle. You have some houses on the right and then obviously the bridge being the, uh, the focal point. It's a very, very busy image but I think it works because I think the busyness almost captures the sort of organised chaos of like a small coastal uh, like seaside town. Now it's just a, a waiting game really. Uh, as you can see the sun is coming up over there and I'm just going to literally wait for it to just paint the top of the bridge um, and everything else hopefully is going to be dark and I just think that's going to look quite nice. Um, so <laughs> excuse the lorry. I'm going to be shooting at f11. Um, I'm not quite sure what the ISO is yet but I'll just pop it up on the screen once I've taken the image. And now we wait. result sometimes patience does pay off I was a little bit skeptical that maybe I'd be waiting for nothing uh, but wasn't the case I got a beautiful beautiful golden sort of orangey glow on the bridge just as I was hoping for so hopefully that's going to turn out to be a really really nice image uh, if not one of the better images of the holiday that's it that's the end of the video Thank you for watching, if you have watched all of it. I mean, thank you for clicking, if you just clicked and skipped through to this bit. Um, if you did enjoy the video, hit that like button, I'm most appreciated. And if you want to see more videos like this, hit that subscribe button too. Totally up to you though, I kind of hate saying that sort of stuff. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I hope you have a nice day.